Um, hi. I honestly did not expect for my video on El Filibusterismo to garner as much attention as it did, and thank you very, very much for all the support that has been shown on that video. I appreciate it so much. Ever since posting that El Filibusterismo, I have gotten so many comments asking me to do more, and while I am very sorry that it took me this long to get around to it, here is the more that people have been asking for. So since that video was about El Filibusterismo, I think it's only appropriate that we turn our eyes to its infamous prequel, Noli Metangere. Before we begin, I would just like to say that because Noli Metangre is much, much longer than El Filibusterismo, and I was on a bit of a time crunch when I made this video, that this will be the what is hopefully the first part of a much longer series that will be summarizing this book. That being said, let's jump in. So, Noli Metangere, which in English literally translates to Touch Me Not, was written and published in 1887 by none other than best boy chick boy Jose Rizal. It was written with the intention of being a very harsh critique towards the treatment of the Spanish Catholic Church to local Filipinos at the time. Um, now, keep in mind that in my last video, I did say that the novels were written with the intent to expose the corruptness of the Spaniards, when in reality, Jose Rizal's novels aren't exactly anti-Spain, they're anti-church. He even wrote the original novels in Spanish, which not a lot of the local Filipinos knew at the time. There's also a common misconception that the novels were written with an underlying message of violent revolt is bad, kids, which isn't really true. Rizal wanted people to think first before actually fighting for independence. He thought that we had to be ready for it. He was against the idea of armed revolts at first, and we'll see that his views shift later on, only slightly, but that's why both novels still warn against violent revolutions, but El Filibusterismo is a little more cavalier with the idea. He wanted us to look a little forward past the initial revolt. What if, for example, we did earn our independence but were unready and would become overwhelmed with the responsibility of leading ourselves? There would be a lot of infighting. We wouldn't be too sure that our freedom was actually ours. There could be corruption. Does that sound familiar? Anyways, let us also keep in mind, my dear friends, that despite these works being seen as symbols of our country, they hold a lot of sentiments that haven't exactly aged gracefully. For example, the idea that Maria Clara was the ideal Filipino woman comes from later pushes from people who misinterpreted the text, and only pushed for her to be the ideal when the Philippines started becoming more westernized and the women were doing things like growing opinions and wanting rights, when originally Rizal wrote for her to symbolize how the Spaniards had suppressed women into ignorance. There's also a lot of racism. Um, Noli in particular has a lot of blatantly racist themes, especially towards Chinese people. I bring these up because a lot of people tend to brush over those facts when discussing Rizal's works, especially because of the pedestal we tend to put him on. We forget that he was still victim to the thinking of the time. He may have been more progressive, but progressive only relative to the time period that they lived in. Okay, now that I've gotten everything that I wanted to say out, let's actually get into the story. We begin focusing on the luxurious and opulent house of one Don Santiago de los Santos, also known as Capitan Tiago, on Calle and Loage in Manila, where he is hosting a large dinner party to celebrate the return of a friend of his. Conversing in a corner are Padre Damaso, the Franciscan curate of the town of Santiago, Padre Sibilia, a Dominican friar, and an elderly lieutenant of the Guardia Civil, or the Civil Guard, Lieutenant Guevara. He is sometimes also known as the Teniente in the Tagalog version. Padre Damaso is busy discussing the rights and natures of the native Filipino people, also referred to as Indios, when his tirade is cut short by the arrival of two more of our main cast, Dr. Tiburcio de Espadaña and his social climbing wife, Doña Victorina. The pleasantries are then cut short by the arrival of our main character. Capitan Tiago introduces them all to Juan Crisostomo Ibarra y Magsalin, the mestizo son of the late Don Rafael Ibarra and future almost wedding crasher. 
It turns out that Ibarra had been away for seven years in Europe to study and had returned for reasons not stated at first. But we'll get back to that. The food is served, and it's pretty uneventful from there on out, except for some brief conversation about what Ibarra had been doing in Europe, where he had gone, what he had seen, and also when Padre Damaso threw a tantrum for getting the neck and wings of the chicken in his tinola. He really loves tinola, it's like his entire thing. After dinner is done, Ibarra excuses himself early from the party, much to Capitan Diago's dismay, and begins on his way home, only to be accosted by Lieutenant Guevara. The two converse for a while, and the lieutenant reveals to Ibarra how exactly his father died because, oh yeah, plot twist, his father died, that's why he came back home, and apparently nobody thought to tell the kid how it happened. And as it turns out, Padre Damaso and Don Rafael had been friends, but due to some sort of falling out, Padre Damaso accused Don Rafael of not going to confession, and he was denounced from the church for his ideas of Christianity. Not long after this, Don Rafael was arrested for the accidental death of a tax collector that he had seen beating up young boys. The Teniente said that he had tried to help by appealing the case, and he had succeeded, but Don Rafael sadly had passed away before he could be released. After this revelation, Ibarra is, well, you know, and makes a hasty return to his hotel room and goes to sleep, plagued by visions of his dying father. Fun fact, these nightmares are supposed to symbolize Ibarra's guilt for leaving his father in the Philippines while pursuing an education in Europe. Instead of delving deeper, at this moment of profound grief within our protagonist, our esteemed author takes this moment to segue and focus more on Capitan Tiago. So, Capitan Tiago, he is rich, unsurprisingly and holds quite the sway over the local community and government, despite technically being a mestizo. Eh, but it's fine, he doesn't exactly consider himself one. He's described as being pretty at peace with God, and he devotes himself to several saints, almost to the point of polytheism. He is also described as being very good to his wife, Doña Patrocino, who is mentioned that one time and then never again. Quick side tangent, Doña Patrocino, was a nightmare to look up. I had like three or four different sources up at the same time, and they all gave me like differing versions of her characters. Sometimes her name is spelled as Donia Patrocinio. Sometimes she's not his wife. Sometimes she's his rival. It. <laughs> and it also turns out that Donia Patrocinio is the Capitan's second wife. His first wife, Donia Pia, died while giving birth to Maria Clara, Capitan Tiago's only child and our main love interest. The lore here is that the Capitan and Doña Pia had had a really hard time conceiving a child, so the Doña is given two pieces of advice, the first being from the women of San Diego to go to Taal and dance in the procession of the Virgin of Turumba, and from Padre Damaso to go to Obando and go dancing in the festival of San Pascual. Take note of the Padre's involvement here, it gets interesting. So the advice works, um, which piece of advice we are not told. They have a kid, the Doña passes, and we know the rest. Growing up, Maria Clara was surrounded by people who adored her. Her aunt, Tia Isabel, her father, Padre Damaso. But she had always seemed a little more on the melancholic side, most likely because of the absence of her mother. When Maria Clara turned 13, she was sent to a nunnery in Binondo, and not too long afterwards, her childhood friend Crisostomo Ibarra was sent away to Europe. And while they were away, Capitan Tiago and Don Rafael agreed on arranging a marriage between the two when they came of age. We suddenly come back to the present, with Ibarra visiting Capitan Tiago's house over in San Diego, Laguna, to speak with Maria Clara. The two converse on the house's azotea and talk about things only two souls in love could converse about. Patriotism and childhoods Maria Clara eventually has to leave with Tia Isabel to fetch her belongings from the convent. Meanwhile, Padre Sibilia talks with an elderly priest about Ibarra's plans and how beneficial a marriage to Maria Clara would be for him. In the next episode, we meet a bunch more characters because honestly, did you think that we ended there? Ibarra nearly murders a priest part one, and we delve a bit into San Diego's history and politics. 
Speaking of politics, by the time that this video is out, it should be campaign season for the May 2022 presidential elections. So if you or if anybody you know is eligible to vote, please do vote and also do your research accordingly. We really do need a change in this country. That's about all the time I have for this video. Um, I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye!